Our next uh, and final item on the agenda is the ISSW at a glance. Um, I, th I think your program online might be up to date, but uh, Don Sheriff is laid low by the COVID and in his place, we have uh, Sarah Carpenter. She wanted me to introduce her as, oh, I'm just a mom. And I'm like, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, Sarah's a previous owner of AAI. She's a longtime ski guide, avalanche forecaster. Um, if anybody in this room has not skied or learned from Sarah, then uh, to quote myself, you've been living under a rock. So Sarah and your panel, here you go, kid. Thanks, Lenny. Good to see everyone. Awesome. As Lynn said, uh, Don Sheriff got sick, and so I am his substitute, but I can't imitate him. So um, we're going to spend the next hour, 75 minutes, uh, hearing from our panel of all of these experienced professionals on highlights from ISSW. And Big Don spent a lot of time organizing uh, highlights from each of these different individuals, uh, so there's not overlap. They are covering basically all of the things that were covered in ISSW. Uh, and I think the great thing is, is if you miss the conference, one, hopefully you don't have COVID or you didn't get COVID, right? Um, and two, this is a great way to get ideas of papers that are interesting, things that are on the cutting edge and that have come out. And so the plan is, is that each of these panelists, I'm gonna just give them a one sentence intro they're gonna go through one at a time and give us about a 12 minute highlight reel from, a, from sort of the segment that Don assigned them. Um, and then at the end of the panel, I have a couple questions from Big Don and we may have some time for questions from y'all. So did I miss anything, panelists? Awesome, cool. Um, and I think what we're gonna start with is Zach. Uh, and you've, y'all have already heard from Zach, but uh, Zach works out of West Glacier, Montana with the USGS Climate Change in Mountain Ecosystems Group. And he's gonna be discussing climate change, snow hydrology and sustainability and planning and engineering. Great. Yes, it's right here. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, cool. Oh, look at, they misspelled my name, how nice. Um, so again, I covered climate and avalanches and uh, planning engineering um, at ISSW, thanks to Big Don's uh, encouragement. So diving into some things, I'm gonna try and keep it relatively brief here, but uh, some standouts in the climate and avalanches research done at ISSW and presented there was way, one big thing in my mind was dendrochronology. It's been actively used and introduced into the avalanche world to reconstruct historical avalanche chronologies across North America and Europe. And these can be used to further our understanding of large magnitude avalanches and their cycles and their ties to regional climatic conditions and longer term trends that then we can extract from these really cool um, data records built into the trees. So dendrochronology, you guys saw a little bit from Steven's presentation there. They're doing a little bit of that work in Little Cottonwood right now. It's super cool because just like we can see fire scars and other climatic conditions in the tree rings, we see avalanche scars um, in and around those rings. And so work being done both, yeah, in Northwest Montana and Europe is helping extend our knowledge of big avalanche cycles back way beyond our observational history, which, you know, we started looking at avalanches and writing them down, at least in North America, maybe in the 60s at best. And these records go back as far as, I think, on this French plot, 1590. Like, pretty incredible stuff to be pulling out of that. Um, so that's one big push from the climate and avalanche world. Another one uh, I want to bring up is some really cool work being done by Ben Reuter. Uh, he's using new methods to look at the way we view avalanche and snow climates. So there was great work done in the 90s and even the 80s, starting to understand what differences are between what we traditionally think of as continental and maritime and intermountain snowpacks. And those are largely based on snow depths and temperatures and things like that. Uh, but what Ben did was super creative. He started running and looking at historical weather data and then running some snow models on it across large geographic regions and then extracting from those snow models the actual avalanche problems that those snowpacks produce. And so instead of grouping it just by snow depths and temperatures, he's instead looking at what are the frequent problems in different areas. 
And he did this for France, um, and it broke out into these four main different regions. Again, with varying amounts of differentiation between them, but it's a super cool way to look at avalanche and snow climates, especially as we see possibly changing climate conditions in the future, where our traditional maritime intermountain and continental maybe don't fit the bill as well as they used to. Um, one other big cool climate and avalanche talk, of course, there are modelers showing up at ISSW. We saw a lot of different modeling. Um, with the climatic modeling, there are folks looking way out into the future, you know, looking at mainly what do snow and avalanches look like in 2099. Of course, because, you know, big academic institutions focused on snow are based in Switzerland. A lot of this research was focused there, but big things to take home from the climate modelers looking long term is that we should expect a lot more wet snow. So please somebody start developing better wet snow wax. Uh, two, <laughs> shorter winters are probably becoming more and more common. And then three, that we're gonna see relatively less unstable like avalanche days. Uh, this is partially tied to just a shorter winter season, but also potentially more frequent warm weather. Again, with that, they also bring up, unfortunately, the dreaded R word and more frequent rain on snow events. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but really cool work there. And then a last kind of wrap up of climate and avalanches. Um, other cool research is being done on wildfire, dust, and snow. Um, this is a really big impact that we see a lot, at least certainly in Colorado and California. I don't know how much Jackson gets dust on snow events, but it's becoming more common. Um, and they have really big effects on the uh, radiation balance and therefore our snow season's length and the avalanche concerns that erupt, or not erupt, that come from the season. Additionally, uh, there's some really cool work being done in the Czech Republic looking at snow cover changes over time. Uh, really, really interesting. We often don't think of mountains outside of like our Central Europe and our North American areas, but really relevant work being done there at big changes. Another one that stood out to me is slush flows. There's a bunch of cool Norwegian research and Alaskan research looking at them. Their avalanche concerns, I haven't thought of that much, but they're apparently a really big problem because they're incredibly destructive avalanches. And so that was super cool to see. And the last big thing with climate and avalanches I wanna bring up is just that climate change is tied to many of the papers at ISSW, whether they're specifically uh, talking about climate or whether it's implied. It's a really common thread that we're seeing now as the snow and avalanche world starting to shift to wondering, are we seeing the same patterns like Steven's talking about, or are we seeing exceptionally large patterns in our avalanches or differences? So super cool stuff. Uh, hopefully that's a decent summary of climate and avalanches. There's a lot more out there. Next up for me was planning engineering. Um, first, I'm gonna start off with some operational rail and road work being done. Um, Hamry et al did some really cool work uh, doing a reanalysis of the traditional avalanche hazard index, which is kind of the foundation of most operational avalanche programs when they're ma managing for roadways or railways or other transportation infrastructure. Um, and that big plot you can see on the left shows traditional avalanche hazard index values versus the, oh, what is CBE? The best, uh, it's consultant's best estimate, I think, is the new version that they're looking at. And this goes into a bit more specifics and is a little bit more of a nuanced scale that him and Big Don and others have developed. Really, really cool stuff because it changes some of the scores. Again, this is geeky operational things, but it's really relevant because it breaks out into individual avalanche paths as well as avalanche areas. And can, over time, if it's reassessed fairly regularly, show changes in focuses for operations. Um, so that was really cool. Additionally, they had some really great research um, being done in Alaska for data-driven racks placement, racks and VEASAN towers and uh, Obelix and all the other cool you know, um, remote explosive tools for avalanche mitigation. And it was cool because they're inter introducing this like full suite of really interesting spatial uh, data and observations to try and get the best placements they could. Other planning engineering things that were cool, uh, Austria has a new cool planning model they use that uh, is really relevant because only 12% of Western Austria is actually viable or suitable for permanent living. And so they're trying to figure out moving and growing populations and where they can fit them in their mountain environments. Um, there's a great presentation from the Bulgarian avalanche community that was doing modeling, mixing both dendrochronology of traditional avalanches and fancy RAMS modeling, which you will see, or if you were at ISSW, you heard tons about. Um, trying to look at those impacts on infrastructure. 
Um, let's see. And then my kind of wrap up for planning engineering here is that there's also some interesting work considering transitions from um, big avalanche issues in Juneau, Alaska to possibly big landslide issues. And something that I think was brought up earlier in the landslide question, um, but these are big changes as we see warmer climates and we see um, a variety of new rain on snow events or rain on dirt events. We can see these kind of problems changing over in places. Last things, considering engineering and planning, there was a lot of research done on new snow protective structures, uh, further advances in 3D modeling of avalanches using rams and applying that to three-dimensional terrain in new ways, a lot of auto weights mapping, um, so that's like the, what is it, automatic terrain uh, evaluation scale, really cool stuff being done, again, dig into the ISSW papers, they're all publicly accessible and available, and lastly, uh, more avalanche hazard index discussions. That was planning and engineering. Thanks for your time. Oh. <laughs> it's poaching. Um, thank you very much. I did, I forgot to mention there is a PDF resource that is gonna be available with links to all of these papers. Um, and there's also on the ISSW 2023 website, there's actually a daily summary. It's um, an illustrator who took notes. And I found that really useful in terms of picking out topics that are relevant to me, that are interesting, that I wanna dig into and, and actually read those papers. So there are some resources. Um, somehow we will get you all the link to the PDF. I forgot to put it on the internet, uh, okay. on, the, I, on the YSAW page, uh, it'll be loaded probably tomorrow morning, um, and it's like one PDF, and it's gonna have QR codes to all of the papers that we reference, um, and I can also probably just email it to people who are here. Yeah, so there are resources, but just take notes as to what papers in, uh, interest you, and then dig in deeper. That's the beauty of a summary like this, is you don't have to, uh, you don't get the opportunity or have to sit through four days of deep talks and get your mind bent. Um, next up, in terms of summary, is uh, Ethan Davis, and Ethan works as an avalanche forecaster for the Sawtooth National, Forecast, National Forest Avalanche Center, and Ethan's going to discuss avalanche forecasting and risk communication. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to prepare, I was tracing the rectangular seat backs with my <laughs> breath, uh, so I think I'm all set and ready to go. So the topics assigned to me are avalanche forecasting and risk communication, which thankfully go hand in hand, so they'll kind of run together. Uh, consistency and snowpack modeling were two things that were main threads throughout the presentations uh, in these topics. So we'll start with consistency. And if you want to just take a picture of these slides, you can on the way. It doesn't have a direct link, but it has the title of each of the papers that I'm referencing as we go along. So the first one I want to highlight is one from Chris Lundy and the National Avalanche Center which talked about the National Avalanche Center's forecast platform. The Avalanche Forecast Platform, or AFP, as uh, we refer to it, was launched in 2019. And currently, 17 of the 22 uh, public avalanche forecast centers covering 50% of the forecasted area in the US are using this platform. Uh, the two major exceptions to that are the Utah Avalanche Center and uh, the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. Uh, the Bridger Teton actually is, is new uh, to this forecast platform as well, so you've probably noticed that change recently. A dashboard interface, so this is what a forecaster would see in the morning, allows uh, avalanche centers to access five different modules, including media galleries, avalanche warnings, uh, a forecast editing platform, um, observation platform, and weather station management tool. In the past, uh, there was very little collaboration that was happening between centers, and as a result, we had wildly different looking forecasts. Uh, we had a lot of sunk costs into everyone developing their own web pages and their own products. So uh, this AFP is a big win for Avalanche Center collaboration. Now we have all of the minds, or a lot of the minds, um, in the Avalanche world all thinking about how we can create and communicate Avalanche hazard most effectively, instead of working in our own little bubbles. And uh, we have a centralization of data, which is really intriguing. So with everyone com um, contributing to the same forecast platform, 
We have thousands and thousands of avalanche occurrences that we can run statistics on across multiple regions, not just one avalanche center, because they're all in a common format. Um, it's also a lot more user-friendly for somebody that's traveling, either as an educator or just a backcountry recreationalist, because they're looking at a product that's a lot more similar across geographic regions. So on the vein of consistency, uh, Tyler Carson from the Fernie Alpine Resort in British Columbia gave a really interesting talk on the application of the Avalanche D-Scale and some uh, suggested modifications. He notes that for specific avalanche, say the one in the photo, uh, practitioners often assign different ratings based on the size, depending on whether they're emphasizing the destructive potential or the actual magnitude, meaning the mass and the, and the length. One finding of his survey of some Canadian avalanche professionals was that some folks consider the greater burial potential of a deep deposit in a terrain trap while others do not. So in this photo, if you're considering the burial poten potential in this terrain trap, you might consider this to be a D2 since it could bury, injure, or kill a person. But ignoring the terrain trap and focusing on the mass, the avalanche is a D1. So there are some discrepancies there. Additionally, a relatively harmless avalanche to a skilled skier or a mountain sledder uh, could seriously injure a construction worker on foot or a beginning skier within a ski area. He then went on to show examples in which the escape skill of the person involved or at risk influenced their rating of the size of the avalanche. So as a public avalanche forecaster, I've noticed this just looking at observations that come in maybe from a group of very skilled riders, and they'll say, oh yeah, we triggered, you know, five avalanches today, but they were all pretty small. And then you scroll down to the media and you're going, whoa, you know, I wouldn't consider that small. Or the same size avalanche rated by a relatively uh, more vulnerable uh, skier with, with lesser ability to escape the avalanche might have rated them as a much larger slide. So Tyler's work was a natural extension of some previous work done by Bruce Jameson. And if you take a picture of this slide, you can watch these videos later. Uh, that I would recommend that you do. Uh, the first video walks through a little bit more of a, a, a slightly different way to work through avalanche size. So by comparing them to ordinary objects, say uh, enough snow to fill one floor of an apartment or enough snow to fill a tennis court, things like that as a gauge for the exact amount of mass included in an avalanche that helps you better rate the, the avalanche size if you're consider considering the magnitude alone. The, uh, the second video is actually a little exercise after you've watched the first one that you get to practice that. So there are a lot that are rated by professionals and you get to use your, your new scale to see if you line up with what the opinions of the professionals are. So it's kind of an, an interesting way to calibrate your avalanche size scale. Finally, they, uh, Tyler presented this, which is a suggestion how we could modify the, the D scale. Uh, to, to use more consistent ratings uh, across, the, across the board. And you can see that the damage potential column and the D1 and D2 realm has been edited to include the consideration of the subject's vulnerability and terrain traps. So instead of relatively harmless to a person, it's to a person on foot, unlikely to bury a person except in runout zones with unfavorable terrain features. So they are starting to add in some qualifiers in there to take into account terrain traps. You can also see that when we talk about run length and deposit volume, there are some uh, more ordinary objects are included into this scale to help the average person sort of uh, formulate a better um, idea of what a D2 or a D3 or a D4 might be by comparing the, the mass to common objects. Like a D2 would fill the floor of a large house approximately two meters deep. A D3 could fill a hockey rink two to three meters deep. Of course, they're Canadian, so they use the hockey rink there. But I think it's a, a hockey rink is two tennis courts, is what they said for us Americans, in case we didn't understand that. OK, moving right along. Uh, Matthias and Norbert, two really cool guys from uh, Austrian and the European Avalanche Warning Service, presented a decision tree uh, solution to increase the consistency of avala avalanche problem selection in their forecast. So they were finding uh, there are a lot of avalanche warning services. They butt up against each other in, uh, 
in the Alps, and uh, they were noticing that while one forecaster on one side of the line might classify an avalanche problem one way, the one on the other side would use different justifications, um, not necessarily invalid ones, but different arguments to arrive at a different problem choice. So what they were trying to do is reconcile that by providing a decision tree that would hopefully bring uh, everybody's opinions in line a little bit more and provide some more consistency across the different European avalanche warning services. Um, beginning at the top, you can see the tree splits into slab or loose snow avalanches. Then it divides into grain types and further divides into a persistent or a non-persistent problem. And finally, it breaks down into whether the problem is identifiable to the to the user or not. So for example, the difference between a storm slab in this tree and a wind slab really comes down to how easy the problem is to identify in the terrain. So if it's easy to identify, you can tell people to avoid wind drifted terrain or pillows or however you describe it in your forecast, then that would end up as a wind slab. If it's harder to identify, then the recommendation based on this tree would be to call it a storm slab problem. Um, this is really important and, and I find useful uh, tool. In fact, it's one that was developed very similarly at the CAIC when I was in the beginning of my career working uh, down there as an avalanche forecaster. That was developed a little over 10 or 12 years ago, I imagine, at this point. And they actually developed a very similar tree, um, which you can see there on the left. That one's out of date. But wait, yeah, wow, it's in color. Somebody must have fixed that for me. Um, so this is the same sort of tree that was developed by the CAIC. And interestingly, I talked to Brian Lazar that uh, helped design this tree. And he went up to Matthias and the guys from the European Avalanche Warning Service. And they, in the spirit of consistency, they are going to uh, come together to help develop, put their minds together and develop one tree. Um, so that'll bring both the European community and the North American community a little closer onto how to select the appropriate avalanche problem for the forecast. This is also just one of the tools because the, the CAIC, as well as the National Avalanche Center, have developed this uh, criteria checklist, which strives to do the same thing. So both the decision tree and this checklist can help, hopefully, forecasters arrive at, at a common avalanche problem, or at least give them the, the correct path to get as close as possible to the final problem. This is also something that we do quite often at the, at the sawtooth. So moving away from some consistency and into some snowpack modeling, uh, modeling I've always kind of shied away from because I always thought that it was a little bit uh, too imprecise and wasn't going to be practical, at least not yet for us. Um, but I, am, I drank the, uh, the snowpack model Kool-Aid and I'm fully on board with uh, snowpack modeling after this ISSW, which is a big change. Uh, to, to kind of catch you guys up if you're not familiar with what the snowpack model is, snowpack is the name of a model, which is actually a snowpack and ground surface model. So it simulates the development of the snowpack during the winter based on weather data. So essentially anywhere that weather data exists, you can kick out a snow profile modeled at any location. The snowpack describes the snow microstructure and the layering of the snowpack. It illustrates how the snowpack interacts with its surroundings by simulating the key physical processes, both mass and energy balance, that take place between the atmosphere, the snow, and the soil. So there were several talks, and uh, one that really caught my attention was the uh, one given by the CAIC and John Snook. One of the inputs that goes into this snowpack model to really make it work well is that you have to have a pretty extensive network of weather stations, which they have in Europe and we do not have in the Western United States. So what the CAIC is doing is they're using numerical weather forecast model output, uh, the WARF model, to feed the snowpack model. So they're running the weather model, taking that as the initializing uh, conditions for the snowpack model, which is really interesting. Um, so this allows them to generate daily snowpack profiles. Oh, I should, I should say, these are my notes from, uh, <laughs> from the snowpack modeling thing. And you can see, eventually, I was just like, I want this. That's, that's literally what I wrote down, because I couldn't keep up with what they were saying, but I knew I wanted it. So um, here we are. 
So this is, this is some of the work that John was doing. And on the left-hand side, you can see that they're out, outputting uh, snow profiles into each one of their little uh, polygons that they can arrange. And then they're averaging them. So each one of those represents an average snow profile of that given region on that day. And it runs multiple times a day. And then on the right, they can also run a time series um, of what the snowpack is going to look or has looked like over the course of the season. So what you're seeing, the, the snow profiles actually look pretty similar to what um, a manual snow pro profile would be. You know, the length of the bar coincides with the hardness, but the color coding is actually the grain type. So the different grain types are represented by different colors. There's depth or at the bottom, facets, and so forth on the way up. This uh, time series, you can see the, the beginning of the season starts on the left-hand side here with new snow, which is green. Then it turns to facets. Then eventually the base of the snowpack turns to depth ore. And then these red colors that come in um, are melt layers. And then eventually, you know, the entire snowpack gets wetted to the ground and then you're in, you're in full depth wet snowpacks. So it's a really cool thing that I'm excited. Um, well, I was very excited about trying to implement at, this, at the Sawtooth this year. So in conversations with John and with, with Scotty and um, Boise State, uh, pretty quickly we found out that they were interested as well and we're gonna be trying to implement this, the, these same models and techniques at the Sawtooth this season for, for Idaho. Moving right along and one that I think that uh, you guys will really find interesting is um, Scott Thumler with the Heli Ski Company Canadian Mountain Holidays. Gave a great talk detailing the measures that they put into place to manage an atypical deep persistent slab problem that they dealt with last season. So CMH operates, this is mind blowing, 11 distinct guided helicopter ski operations with over 3,500 skier runs per day in their peak season, which is hard to fathom. And uh, that means that they have to utilize a lot of avalanche terrain every single day that they're in operation. And the underpinning of their entire season was this deep persistence lab problem. So his paper discusses specific tactics that they use to manage this problem. And as you can see, even guided operations now are using, oops, are using the snowpack model, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, I think that the Snowpack model is useful for regional forecasting. It's also useful for large tenured um, guiding operations, but I think that the applicability of those sorts of models is gonna trickle down into even smaller guided operations in ski areas as well as the model resolutions increase in the future. So you can see this was one of the modeled snowpacks for his one of the zones in his area provided by the Canadian Avalanche Association. And their coloring is slightly different here, but you can see that purple color at the bottom as they developed a depth or layer in late November, and that persisted throughout the entirety of their season. At least that's what the model was predicting. And uh, when they went out there, they were finding that as well. So it gave them a little bit of a, a heads up. So the tactics that he used were the really in interesting things to me, and I think will be interesting to you guys. Of course, they used extensive uh, explosive control. They also employed just straight out seasonal closures on a lot of avalanche terrain that they deemed inappropriate with that problem. Um, the one that I thought was interesting was this magenta run coding. Does that ring a bell to anyone or is that something that they invented? Does anyone know what magenta run coding would be? Sweet. So I thought that this was really a clever thing. Essentially, magenta run coding is a runless procedure that purposefully slows the opening of new terrain by 24 hours. So they would send a snow safety team in to assess the terrain that they would like to open for the day. So if it was either previously closed or it was closed for a persistent slab problem, that team would go out there and assess it. If they deemed that it was worthy or safe enough to open and add to the run list, it didn't get added that day. It had a 24 hour hold on it, which I thought was kind of a clever technique to allow that kind of urgency and demand from, from um, the skiers themselves in the operation to be separate from the snow safety decision on whether it was appropriate to open or not, because it wasn't even gonna be opened until the next day at the very earliest. Um, 
So I'd highly recommend that you go in and you uh, read the discussion section of this paper because Scott outlines the nuances, the unintended consequences of employing these three techniques and some opportunities for or, uh, improvement with some of the techniques that he suggested. It's a, it was a really great presentation and a really interesting um, paper to read after the fact. And uh, that wraps up my recap. Thank you. Thanks, Ethan. All sorts of interesting uh, things coming down the pipe. Uh, next up is Lori Delaney. We just got to hear from Lori. Uh, and as you know, she works in Little Cottonwood Canyon, uh, leading the Highway Avalanche Forecast Program for UDOT. She's going to discuss avalanche operations and program management, instrumentation, and remote sensing. Thanks, Sarah. OK. Um, avalanche operations. I'm going to start with the instrumentation and remote sensing. Um, there's a lot out there. Uh, it was really interesting to see what people are doing these days at ISSW. There's a lot of technologies that are being developed or really more accurately appropriated to the snow world and the avalanche industry. LIDAR, radar, infrasound, photogrammetry, um, and also the use of unmanned aerial systems or UASs or drones. So um, it's pretty cool what's going on in the industry right now. Just super quick, I'm going to run through some of these papers that, and presentations that I thought were really interesting. Um, Kevin Hammond's paper about detecting liquid snow in the snowpack is worth checking out. Um, it, it's really interesting, some of the methods that he was using to actually look at snow, both in snow pit walls. You could see the layering in a really different fashion and the water in the snowpack um, really well. It was pretty cool. Um, hyperspectrometry, something like that. And uh, then he had some also really interesting studies with upward looking radar that he was then able to use to 3D model snow, snow channels as they move through um, the snowpack. So if you're interested in that at all, I would recommend that paper. Um, you know, the automa automated detection that's being developed out there. Um, that's pretty close to home for us because we use some of that within Little Cottonwood Canyon, but we're always looking for further opportunities to be better. Um, so there's a couple things out there. Jeff Johnson, in conjunction with some other folks, did a poster and presentation about their infrasound that they're developing. I think it's called Heard But Not Seen. So if you're interested in that, and then there's also some really cool papers that the Geo Provence folks put together using radar. And this is primarily in Europe at this point, but it's been really well, well field tested there with great success. It's starting to move into North America. Um, we're pretty interested in that. It's spendy, but it looks effective. And then what I thought was in particular of particular interest um, was looking at some of the work in Alaska with Alaska DOT and Alaska Railway. They're really looking at uh, using the unmanned aerial systems for mitigation and monitoring. And the mitigation is pretty interesting in its own right, and we'll see where that goes. But I think the monitoring is kind of more, more realistically close to happening and being useful. Um, it was interesting for a lot of reasons, but to me, of most interest was the fact that they're really working on developing these remote docks for these UAS systems. So it's a little bit hard to tell here, but um, this is the UAS or the drone here, and this is the remote dock. So it's actually harbored within the dock, and then it opens up and deploys it, and you can do this, obviously, remotely. Um, at a set time with a set uh, route programmed in at, at any time. And I see this once they work out the kinks is um, being really useful for a lot of things for mapping uh, without the snowpack, for snowpack mapping throughout the season, and then avalanche monitoring depending, you know, they were really hopeful with what they were going to put on their particular UAS. It was going to be a Swiss Army knife of options, basically. So I thought that was 
pretty worthy for the future. And then I'll move into the avalanche operations and program management. And um, I didn't put anything up for it, but the framework for measuring performance of highway and railway programs, if you're into that kind of thing, it's pretty interesting. Um, you know, it could be, you don't have to be a roadway or a railway necessarily, but if you are interested in those types of operations, I would check it out. Um, it might be applicable to other operations as well, just giving you a framework for how you could maybe compartmentalize certain aspects of your operation and rate it, and then give yourselves a rating and maybe how to improve. But a big part of that particular paper was also the reason they're quantifying these different aspects of these programs is to help give justification for improvements or changes. In particular, if you're looking to implement a RACS program, how do you justify that? Um, so it might be worth checking out if you are interested in moving that direction within your program. And then um, the thing I'm going to talk about the most, I really found this Kimano T2 project interesting. So this is in BC. And this is a five-year uh, program, and it's all based around building a 16-kilometer long water supply tunnel through the Central Coast Mountains in BC to, to supply a hydroelectric power generation station. And um, this project goes through some real deal terrain. So the 11-kilometer mile supply road was heavily impacted by avalanches. And then the main job site here is um, extremely affected by avalanches, in particular one large avalanche path. So um, if you're interested in looking at how they developed this program from the ground up, uh, utilizing older studies, which was really important to them, but um, creating this program, implementing it, and then running it for the five years lessons learned, et cetera. I thought it was pretty interesting um, because of the way they developed it. It's the modern era, so they looked at everything and they went ahead and decided that a mix of both passive and active um, mitigation methods would be best used here. And uh, for someone who has inherited a program that's 98% active, and we just wish we had some passive. I think that's really great foresight. Um, they ended up building two large, there's a large diversion berm that's 10, um, 10 meters tall, and then a further blocking wall here that's eight meters tall back there. In addition to that, the active control measures that they implemented, they put in, I believe, 11 Gazexes both over this active work site as well as along and above the roadway, and then the active forecasting program in addition to helicopter bombing as needed. Um, their original goal was 24-7 year-round. They ended up having some growing pains and learning that that wasn't necessarily possible, so they implemented closures overnight every time the hazard rating was above low. Um, <coughs> And it's just a really well-documented description of that whole process. And, you know, they acknowledge it in their paper, but it shows the value of documentation um, and all that previous work and knowledge that they built upon. So that's what I've got. Thanks, Laurie. It's, as I'm listening to all this, it really is, I always think about ISSW, the motto is the merging of theory and practice. And I also love how many different aspects of our industry are discussed and studied and presented. So, and we have this amazing cross-section in our panelists, so it's a really valuable uh, contribution to our community right now. So thanks, y'all. Um, next up, we have Liz King, and Liz is the interim director of the TCSAR Foundation. She's also a lead instructor for the American Avalanche Institute with recreational and pro courses. And Liz is going to be discussing rescue and operational stress management as well as decision making. 
All right, um, disclaimer, I'm gonna rely on my notes a bit, especially because I'm talking about other people's research and work. I wanna be really careful not to like put my take and opinions too deeply into it, so. Um, we are, I'm gonna cover rescue and operational stress management, which was one segment, and decision making. Um, Y'all have probably already heard a little bit about COVID ripping through ISSW. Uh, the other thing that happened at ISSW was the power went out in all of Bend for about half a day. Uh, and so because of that, we lost a panel discussion on operational stress management. Um, and so some of that information was kind of shoved into the segment that closed it out on Friday. Uh, and so I'm gonna do my best to like kind of parse out what was what. The whole thing with like COVID and also all of the power shutting down with this, this AV team did this incredible pivot and put us all in the parking lot uh, with a generator and a monitor. But it made me really think like, okay, avalanche professionals, like we are really good at bailing on plan A because uh, there was like a lot of plan B and C. And like Don, who is not here today, right? Sarah's are helping us out. Don actually also gave somebody else's presentation because the original presenter was out sick. And so it's all just been, Flexibility is really important. Um, the papers that I'm gonna spend the most time talking about are these three. Um, I'll probably reference one other presentation. I have slides for Dr. Laura McGuire's and for Brian Lazar and Laura McGladry's that I'll go over. Um, I do wanna just start by kind of referencing Pascal's paper in his presentation. It was really interesting. Um, Pascal runs the Simon Fraser University Research Program, and if you have attended YSAW regularly, you've seen several folks from his department come speak. Um, this is where we get a lot of the research um, about like how people kind of perceive the avalanche forecast and how people like understand the information that they're getting. And Pascal basically made this huge push that we are not doing a good enough job incorporating social scientists into our research and looking specifically at human factor and human behaviors and that we are maybe blowing it in some of our research when we're uh, not really bringing scientists in when we formulate our questions or gather a sample size group. And it was pretty interesting, he referenced Ian McCammon's facets work, which Ian is here and presenting tomorrow, and how that work, which I think was like 20 years old at this point, is still like the bedrock of our human factor curriculum in the avalanche industry. And it's fabulous, like I use it and reference it all season long. And the fact that we like have not moved forward and also didn't really like take that and do anything with it is also just kind of proof that we have a lot of work to do in the behavioral sciences side of um, thinking about avalanches and risk. And it's, it's the human part, right? Like the computer models are fabulous uh, and our understanding of snowpack and weather is increasing every day. Like AI will be writing our forecasts, I think within five years, sorry to some of y'all, <laughs> but I think it's true. Uh, but the human factor stuff, we're still like, you know, stuck and haven't been able to move forward. And so basically his call was like, if you've got a great idea and a study that you wanna run and um, a question you wanna ask or something you wanna crack into, like do it and slow down and pair with a social scientist and make sure that you are formulating a study and having a wide enough reach that we're gonna gather useful data and actually know how to ask the right questions, um, which was really interesting to me. Like I have built surveys and run survey programs before and then gotten some data and been like, this is useless. Like I didn't, I didn't know how to formulate the questions. And so I think that we do have big strides to make there to sort of catch back up with where the more objective fields of research in our industry are. Um, I feel like I was on a soapbox, but also listening to him, I felt like he was a little bit on a soapbox, so I'm like passing that on to y'all. Um, I thought that I was gonna get like the only two big picture topics that didn't talk about models at all, and they don't talk about computer models, um, but one of the ones I was really interested in was Dr. Laura McGuire's discussion of mental models. Uh, and what she was really interested in doing um, was she was interested in looking at the cognitive process that avalanche professionals use and we sort of as novices get into the industry and start following pros around and sort of see people on their feet, see them kind of observing changes in conditions, like taking a feel of the snow and like something happens internally and then they make a decision about how to navigate the terrain or like where to place a shot or whether or not to do a ski cut. And there is actually like science behind what's happening in there. I think we've always just thought of it as intuition. Um, and what Laura worked to do was find actually like the cognitive research that can explain and back up what is happening inside our brains. And there is a research field already that exists looking at mental models. And this is kind of a, a graph, a figure that she uses in her paper that sort of describes what that is. And it really actually does explain the internal process 
that is happening for how we deal with the external world and make decisions. Uh, this was really interesting to me. I have a background in outdoor or experiential education, and we sort of always talk about like the like plan, do, reflect, adjust, repeat. Like there's all these different. There's like the Kolb learning cycle and the OODA loop and all these different models that basically are a simplified version of this. But um, you have kind of information and knowledge and a background and experience and training and you take that out into the field every day and you kind of test it and see the conditions that you have and hopefully at the end of every day um, you're processing that and you're thinking like, was I surprised today? Like what was different today? Did that go well? Um, and adjusting accordingly. And what is happening cognitively is, is we are running through the mental model process and there's a whole field of academic research. Um, Zach mentioned earlier in his presentation at the start of the day that um, it was really fun to actually do some research that gave science to something we kind of already knew. And a lot of ISSW for me was that. Like almost all of the presentations were these deep scientific explorations and proof of things that we've like talked about and known forever. Um, I mean there was one presentation about how like you're more likely to hit a trigger point on an up track than on a down track with like deep computer modeling. And it was neat to see the science and it was like, yeah, of course, like I've heard that from like everybody who came before me. Um, and this is the same thing for me, but explaining our cognitive process. What was really interesting that Laura did was she took it a few steps like further into the like, what does this all mean? And like, what do I think about this? And what should we do with it? And what I, came away thinking about was like, okay, the two ends of the spectrum, like the novice and the seasoned pro. Um, in our industry, we don't really do a great job of setting people up with training. Like often it's like two weeks or 10 days of formal training um, and then people are kind of out on their own and we're just like seek mentorship. Um, and so we're not giving people uh, fabulous scaffolding to be able to go out and really like test their knowledge and their experience without like big catastrophic consequences. And so what we're doing to those people is, is we're putting them in like a hyper cycle of like the mental model world. And so it just really shows that you can actually use mentorship in some of this like reinforcement and update and rejection process to help people be able to like form their knowledge faster. And that like is why mentorship is super important. That's like why debriefs are super important. If you don't like take the time to adjust your model, you might just default back back to the same old, same old. And that's why um, I was thinking about the seasoned pros when I was thinking about this. Um, we often are not that great once we have a lot of experience. We're not that great at recognizing things that don't fall into our normal patterns. Like here in the Tetons, we're like not that awesome um, uh, when the winds are loading westerly slopes. And so I think that the mental model piece is something that we should think about and continue to challenge ourselves to update, especially as we're moving into a new world of forecasting with climate change. Like I see people kind of talk about this a lot who are pros uh, with regards to what forecasting wet slides looks like these days or dry to wet slides. And there's a lot of patterns that we have and things that maybe have worked for decades that we now need to make sure we're staying flexible with. And really this is just having a growth mindset. Um, if that's not a term you know, Google it or find me and I'll explain it to you, but it's super important. Um, and essentially we can do things in our culture to make sure that we're having flexible mental models. And so really what was pointed to in her paper is, is how often the people with flexible mental models said things things like, I don't know, or I'll never know everything there is to know about this, or um, asking somebody else what they thought about it. And so if we have a culture of approaching things with curiosity and humility, we're going to stay flexible and have a better cognitive process where hopefully we're able to see things that don't fit our model and adjust in the moment with lower consequences versus being stuck in having something surprise us in a way that's pretty bad. Um, so again, like, I think we kind of know all of this stuff already, but having a model and some science behind it helps me better understand my brain and it can also help me catch myself when I'm in a role where I've been like only in the mentor role for a longer period of time, like kind of keep myself honest and make sure I'm asking other people like, hey, what do you think? Or like when you head out today, what kind of things are you looking for? Or based on this hazard, um, what stuff is front of mind for you today? And being able to be curious and ask questions so I can update my models. Um, one quote about mental models that helped me is, is it's an academic way to define them is that they uh, take our cognitive assumptions and explain about, they are the explanation, excuse me, of how our cognitive assumptions about how the world works. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, Shifting gears dramatically, we already saw some of this today in Sarah's talk, um, but moving into the rescue and operational stress management, 
there were four really interesting, actually three really interesting presentations um, that were all really different from each other. Uh, and it concluded with a joint presentation from Laura McGladry, who has presented on this topic here at YSAW before, and Brian Lazar, who works for CAIC. And they went over the stress continuum model, which we already saw today, and stress injuries. But then they looked at how this is actually being applied in Colorado and what organizations are doing about it. And I thought that that was really neat to see. Um, full disclaimer, I borrowed, with permission, these slides. And so uh, Laura and Brian put all of these slides together, so this is their work. Um, so again, you can see stress injury defined, and you can see the origin of the stress continuum. Um, this is it started in the military somewhere um, and then has been adopted for first responders. Laura McGladry's organization, the Responder Alliance, which who does great work, adopted this for the first responder community um, and has done a whole lot of trainings with different teams, including teams here in the Tetons, um, to see how they can better operationalize and institutionalize some awareness about this. And so a lot of organizations in Colorado took this and ran with it. They made it more friendly um, for avalanche professionals, something we're like really able to recognize pretty quickly, um, and asked different organizations to have some sort of formalized system where they can check in as a team about it and have awareness of how their team is doing. Um, that took the form of like Google Forms and apps. And so some of these, I feel like there should be credits on these. Some of these are from the CAIC team. Some of these are from various ski patrols. And I know like the snow mass snow safety team has a daily app where they all go in and they basically like individually and anonymously put down the color that they are for every day. And so every day, right, you get your weather report and you get, um, gosh, like the snow rip totals and the information about which chairs are open and you know which runs have been groomed been groomed, and then you also get a snapshot of the team's readiness for the day with regards to stress injury levels. And Brian was really interesting. Uh, I had breakfast with him that morning and asked him kind of like, oh, uh, yeah, cool to see you're presenting about this. Like, I didn't know that was your world. He's like, this is not my world. He's like, I actually was resistant to this. I don't know that much about it. I thought this was going to add workload to an already really busy season. I was stressed about having to do this and thought that that in and of itself was really counterproductive. And he's like, and my take home was this was so easy. Like, this was so easy to do. Everybody should do it. I cannot believe that I like grumbled about it or put it off at all. And so it was really interesting to see his advocacy for it. And then really, like once you get this up and running, how simple it was. And so everybody self-reports. This is what the app looks like. This is Eldora Ski Patrol. Um, and then you can just sort of see throughout the week like what the snapshot of your team is and their readiness. The search and rescue team here has a similar thing that they do on a monthly basis. It's anonymous also, and it is really interesting. You can see a snapshot like of where you are, and you can follow certain trends. Like there are certain trends of stress uh, spiking during the bad times of the pandemic. Uh, in the ski and avalanche mitigation world, what they see is is big, big like operational spikes with their teams during really dangerous avalanche cycles. And that's not surprising, but it is really interesting to see that actually play out with your people. And having that awareness just opens the doors for conversation. And since it's anonymous, it's not like anybody's getting like pulled in or pulled off um, the route for the day, but they have usually been given like a stress buddy at the beginning of the season. And so maybe it's just a trigger to check in with a person like your stress buddy, whether or not they're somebody who is in the orange that day, you just know that, hey, maybe the team isn't doing that great and it's time to kind of like tap my friend um, or do some self-care just to make sure that I am showing up for the team um, as best as possible, green or as close to green, so that we can be the best team as possible. I thought that was super interesting. Um, and so, yeah, that's the end of my slides. The last one that I wanted to just give a nod to, I actually didn't plan to talk about it and I did not embed it in my summary, but I kind of can't stop thinking about it, is Mike Ferrari from Mount Rose Ski Tahoe gave an overview of a lawsuit that their ski patrol was involved in after a death on their mountain where somebody was caught and carried and buried in an avalanche in inbounds terrain, but that had been closed that day. And it was really interesting to see him walk, or hear him walk through the entire litigation process. Um, and they, they were, I um, don't know all the lawyer words, um, they were not at fault. Um, you know, somebody ducked a rope, it was obviously closed, and it's still we're a litigious society, so it's still like a whole thing that you have to go through. And some of the forensic analysis of the terrain and what that patrol kind of had to have piled onto their workload to just be able to navigate that legal process was really interesting. Um, and again, they were not at fault for that, and I think it just kind of 
caught me a little bit, like, oh, right, uh, often with accidents, like, we're so want to look for, like, what went wrong or what was the bad decision, and I'm not saying there weren't any bad decisions this day, like some, you know, there were ropes up, um, but just we work in this industry, and so I think you also, as a professional, like sign up and buy a ticket to a show to open yourself up to some of that kind of litigation. And so I was really grateful that he shared that with us. Um, thanks, that's what I had to talk about, yeah. Thanks, Liz. Uh, next up, we have Scott Savage, who is the director of the Sawtooth National Forest Avalanche Center and the president of the American Avalanche Association. And Scott's going to be discussing snow and snowpack properties, avalanche formation, failure, and dynamics. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, sir. Um, yeah, fresh off the, you can see we modified our logo from ISSW a little bit. Had to add the spike protein there. That was actually the handiwork of Ethan Green, who has COVID and he was bored. So he sent that to me. Um, so I do have his okay to use that. Let's see, so the laser is the flower in the middle, is that right? Yeah, perfect. So I feel like I, I kind of won the lottery twice in the last 10 days. One, I didn't get COVID. One of the, the few people, and, and it wasn't due to a lack of exposure there. So there were a lot of sick people. And two, getting these topics. Um, Snow and snowpack properties and avalanche formation failure and dynamics. For the most part, there are two styles of talks at ISSW. There was the super shear, which is a really cool new model of crack propagation, but it doesn't have a lot of directly applicable uh, you know, practical applications yet. So I'm gonna ignore that one and definitely read about it and watch some talks because it is really interesting and really cool. But I don't think it's as applicable as the other one, which is snow pits. There were four different talks on snow pits, which is what I'm gonna focus on, and then maybe get to one other talk. So the talks on snow pits, uh, four different talks. Uh, Carl Brooklyn gave a review that's basically, a, you know, what do we know after 30, 40 years of studying these things for relative pros and cons? And then Alex Marienthal will be talking tomorrow, so I'm not gonna totally spoil his talk. He's doing this exact talk, but he looked at stability test error rates, and uh, it's probably, things are a little different than what we initially thought, or what we have thought. And then a really interesting talk that Andy Madero did on um, craftsmanship, and it does matter. And then Grom, or Dave Richards, you still here, Dave? Nice. <laughs> so I'm gonna glance over that one, because you already know everything there is to know. Um, but yeah, really interesting way to look at a holistic approach to a, a snow pit score. So these are Carl's slides. Um, and yeah, the, like I said, this is kind of a, almost a review of, I'm gonna get where I can look at my notes. If I, yeah, I don't have any, perfect. <laughs> Makes it easier. So one of his key, one of his key points was that uh, stability tests are not avalanches, that it's a different scale, that you know, you can't, you can't scale things from a snow pit to what's happening on a slope. You have all kinds of spatial variability, which Zach talked about earlier today. I'm sorry I missed that talk. Um, but it, it just doesn't lend itself to a one-to-one a -one direct causal relationship. Um, so Carl really wanted to, to impress upon everyone that, that there is no substitute for slope scale tests like explosives. So if you're doing a stability test, you're just testing a little tiny piece. And if you're throwing an explosive on a slope, you are actually testing something on the slope scale. They're the best, best tool that we have right now to test stability. Um, otherwise, we're, we're kind of guessing a little bit, which Alex will get into in his talk tomorrow. Um, so he looked at four different commonly used tests, the ECT, PST, Roche block, and compression test. And so with this little diagram here, I think this is probably review for everyone, but you have the stability test result can either yield an unstable or stable result versus a slope stability, which is evaluated, that's the hard part of the equation, to say what is the slope stability, unstable or stable. But you can have accurate results there, so true unstable, 
or true stable, so that's when the stability test and the um, slope stability agree with each other. And then the problems where we have errors are either a false stable, so that means your, your stability test says this slope is stable, or says, you know, the test indicates stability, versus the slope is actually unstable. And the false unstable, where you have a stability test that says this area is unstable, but the slope is actually stable. So two errors, the false stable is the worst one, that's how you get killed. If your stability test says this is good to go, and people go onto the slope, it's actually unstable, you trigger an avalanche. Um, so a few just general uh, limitations with the variety of these tests. Let's look up this way. So minimum slab depth. So with the, the tests, the ECT and CT, where you're tapping a shovel on top of the snowpack, the shovel can't physically get down to the weak layer. So if you have a really soft slab or a weak layer that's close to the surface, doesn't work. And same thing with a Roche block. If your ski penetration is getting down to the weak layer, then you shouldn't trust the results. For maximum slab depths, it's about 1 to 1.2 meters from uh, Carl's review, where you can generally trust the results for, uh, I don't know if there's another, oh, I'll go back. So yeah, 1 to 1.2 meters uh, with an ECT or CT, um, especially an ECT, you know, to, to isolate a 1.2 meter compression test, you have this really narrow column that gets really tall and to keep it perfectly straight and not wandering, it gets really difficult. Um, that number can be shorter too. If you have a really hard slab, um, then you're probably not gonna get accurate results because you're gonna have to hit the thing so hard, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna have issues getting good results with a, a really hard 1.2 meter thick slab. Uh, the PST is a little bit better with deeper layers, but you do need to have the column be about one and a half times the slab depth. So you, you find yourself getting uh, some major excavation projects pretty quickly. And slope angle dependence, this is a really important one. So big benefit with the ECT, CT, and PST is that the results are independent of slope angle. So you don't have to be in the 38 degree starting zone to evaluate the, the snowpack and do stability tests. If you have an area that's representative, meaning a very similar snowpack, you can be on flat ground right next to it. I mean, it's not gonna be exactly the same, but you can definitely be on that 28 degree slope and extrapolate those results to a 45 degree slope right next to it, if the snowpack is the same, that, and that's a big qualifier. Uh, the Reich block, there are some modest effects as you get into the steeper avalanche terrain. So looking at the chart here with all the tests, and I don't know why the tests aren't showing up there, are they? That's really odd. All kinds of artifacts. So on the top you have, looks like an ECT top, Roish block, then third one down is a PST, last one down is a CT. So do these tests, uh, identify the slab and weak layer, that is your layer of concern. So yes for all of them with the exception of the PST, which that takes some, a little more skill that you have to decide what layer you're testing, so it's not gonna pop out. So if there are multiple layers that you're potentially worried about, then you have to do the legwork before you actually start sliding the saw up through it, so that doesn't work there. Do they measure crack initiation? So all of the tests with the exception of the, the PST, do measure how difficult is it to initiate a crack, to initiate that failure, and that partly does. And then do they measure propagation? So in this event, all of the longer column tests, so a Roche block, a uh, ECT and a PST, yes, they do give you some insight into how, how is that crack, in a pr crack going to propagate, and not so much partly with the yeah, I got a lot of this. I wonder why this is all goofed up. Uh, but basically the shear quality there with a CT, it gives you a little bit of insight into that, the fracture character or shear quality. If it's a Q1, it, it's telling you something probably about that, uh, that ability to propagate. And then the relative accuracy, which, uh, you know, he has three pluses for the ECT and the Roish block, and then two pluses for the PST, and one for the CT, and this is based on kind of error rates 
I think Eric, um, Alex is going to get into this more tomorrow. So again, I, I don't want to spoil it. I think uh, three pluses might be stretching it. So Alex's talk tomorrow, just a, a super simple um, synopsis of it. The methodology matters in determining the accuracy. So that the actual slope stability is really difficult to say what it is with, with certainty. You know, a lot of the times if we're, uh, for the, the research that all these folks are doing, pulling a you know, large data set of people digging snow pits and doing stability tests, and they need to relate that so the stability test, they need to assign a, a rating for a slope stability on that. And unless you either had an avalanche, then you know it's unstable, or through a bunch of explosives in well-placed spots, then you know that it's stable. Otherwise, you're in some gray area in between, and there's a feedback loop where if you dig three pits and they all show stable results, are you going to say the slope's stable or unstable? Stable, right? You need to see who's awake. And the same thing, conversely, if you dig a bunch of pits and do stability tests and you have a bunch of unstable results, you're going to tend to say that it's unstable. So a lot of the previous research, you know, it could be flawed there that it probably shows that there's a lower error rate than there actually is due to that feedback loop where the, the stability test results drive the slope stability rating. So he, he looks at some uh, interesting ways to come up with some more current uh, error rates, which is awesome. It's something that's been needed to be done, so it's a great talk. And then this was a, a really amazing, simple experiment. Um, so Andy Madero up in Alaska and John Sykes, um, who's a PhD student at Simon Fraser University and also works at the Chugach Avalanche Center up there, National Forest Avalanche Center. They did CTs and ECTs, and they wanted to look at irregular sizes. So if you're cutting your columns, and they're either narrower at the bottom, so basically going like that, or wider at the bottom, going like that, or if you just have the whole thing wider. How does that affect the results? And it has some really profound results. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at the taps to failure on compression tests, so on CTs. So the blue is if it's narrower at the bottom, so it's 30 by 30 at the top but then it tapers down to 20 centimeters by 30 centimeters at the bottom. And you can see far less taps, so about 16 right there. And then a 30 by 30, if they're plumb and square, it's about 20 taps. And then it bumps up if you're um, flaring, so basically getting wider towards the bottom. So going from a, a narrower, less surface area at the top to wider at the bottom, then it's gonna give the impression that it's a lot more stable in the stability test. It's harder to initiate a crack. And where it really pops is in the ECTs over on the right-hand chart. So with that narrower at the bottom, all ECTPs, 20 of them. And this is the same snowpack. And then when you have the standard column, it's three out of uh, 20 were ECTPs. The other 17 were ECTX. And then once you uh, made it wider at the bottom, then it's all ECTXs. So you can see that at your craftsmanship, if you're, especially if you're inconsistent with it, if you're consistent, consistently wrong one way, then it's probably not as huge a deal, but if you're inconsistent, you know, if you do two of them and you both of them, you're maybe making them flare out wider at the bottom, you're gonna get a false sense of stability compared to what it actually is. So it, it's really important to be checking that. Uh, that was kind of an eye opener, I think, to a lot of folks and such a simple, elegant experiment, really, Really cool project. And then Dave already did his talk, so find him afterwards if you have any other questions. Awesome idea, and I'm uh, really excited to kind of play with this to, to get that more holistic view of, uh, of what snow picks and uh, associated stability tests can do for us. So the big take home points with all of these, the, the snow pit section of ISSW. So stability tests are not a silver bullet. Uh, you'll see that more so when you hear Alex's talk tomorrow. And spatial variability and that confirmation bias that I was talking about, the feedback loop, where you're, you're going to tend to rate the slope stability what your test said it was, any logical person would. Um, they drive some relatively high error rates. And craftsmanship matters a lot. That paper is definitely worth reading, uh, the Andy Monero one. And then 
the overall impression from Carl and from a lot of these uh, talks was that you really need to prioritize the slope scale information that we get when we're out there over these smaller point sources that are so susceptible to spatial variability, like Zach was getting at it. Again, I wish I saw it, but I'm sure he hit upon that, that uh, all kinds of bad things can happen by looking at you know little pixels on a TV screen. You don't see the whole picture. So things like avalanches, collapsing, cracking, and the weak layer and slab distribution on a slope, those are uh, far less vulnerable to spatial variability and um, other issues that we have. Uh, let's see, I'll spend a couple minutes on this real quick. It's one that I think is, is something that's really interesting and gives some insight into another really applicable topic for us. Then I'll get out of here and we can all do our thing. Oh no, then we gotta answer questions. And it's time to play Stump the Chumps. Hmm? Oh God, I'm sorry. I have not slept enough. It's been a long two, three weeks. So yeah, Jason Konigsberg and others who work at the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, they looked at uh, WUMPs, and these are Jason's slides. He was nice enough to share them. So they looked at two data sets from two different zones in the front range up there on the upper right, and then down in the San Juans. And their uh, way of collecting data was really cool. So they looked at 13 years of observations and did a search for every way that you can spell collapse or WUMP or WUMPF to try to pull everything they could out of the observations. And they came up with you know, some pretty big numbers there to look at the number of observations that had reports of av avalanches and woomphing. So as you plot those, this is up for the front range. You can see both the avalanches and the woomphs. Avalanches is red. They both incre increase at a fairly similar rate while the snowpack's shallow. And then they diverge, where avalanches continue to increase in frequency where the wumps decrease after about a meter. And then once you get to a deeper snowpack, they both start decreasing. So they, they move in tandem. We'll get to why that matters here in a minute. So they divided things into three things that, uh, excuse me, three different bins basically for the snowpack depth, shallow, medium, and deeper. And it's all relative, it's Colorado. So, you know, 50 centimeters is deep down there. So in both shallow and deep snowpacks, they move in conjunction. That the, an increasing amount of wumps coincided with an increasing amount of avalanches when the snowpack's shallow. And then when it's deeper, wumps and avalanches both decreased. But in that medium snowpack depth, something else is going on where the, the incidence of wumping decreases, but the incidence of avalanches, triggered avalanches or natural, still keeps increasing. And then looking at the San Juans, it's uh, similar with the shallow snowpack, and then gets kind of messy in the middle, and then you see that same pattern at the end where both uh, woomphing and avalanche activity are decreasing. So there you have that same relationship when it's shallow or deep, where wumps and avalanches increase, and then when it's deeper, they, start to de they both decrease in conjunction, but woomphing stays kind of flat, um, as opposed to in the front range where the woomphing was decreasing and that, while the avalanche also, the avalanche activity does increase. So the implications um, that they use and that it, it probably makes sense to think about this just in your own travels and when you're teaching classes or whatever you're doing, that when you have a shallow snowpack, um, if you observe wumps, avoid steep slopes. It's a pretty hand-in-hand -hand relationship when the snowpack's shallow, that if it's woomphing, there's a good chance you're gonna be able to trigger avalanches. Then you get into that middle zone where the woomphing is decreasing, but the avalanches are still increasing. So there you may or may not observe wumps before you trigger an avalanche. And then as it gets deeper, we, you know, whether it's public forecasting messaging like what we do or what you're seeing or what you're, how you're basing your travel and guiding operations, you won't observe wumps before triggering a deadly avalanche. So it's kind of a natural evolution, and it's, again, to get back to what Liz was saying, it, a lot of it supports what we, already, what we thought we already knew, in a nutshell. And then, I'm not gonna go over this one, but Zach Guy had an interesting talk on wet slab forecasting that would be a, a good one to read through, and the, the short summary is that it's really difficult to time the exact onset and when the activity decreases. In general, they tended to 
to lag behind, things got scary before they thought it, they were gonna get scary, and then the activity ceased before they thought it would, so they tended to overestimate the danger, let it ride longer after the end of wet slab activity. And I can say from personal experience, we tend to do the same thing. You know, it's easy to get fooled, so they're, they're uh, one step short of voodoo, forecasting wet slabs on a slope scale for sure, and his experience has just uh, added to that attitude. So that's all I have on to Gabrielle, I'm so sorry. But Sarah first. Thanks, Scotty. And our last summary is uh, Gabrielle Antonoli, who is an avalanche forecaster here at the Bridger Teton Avalanche Center. Uh, and she's going to discuss avalanche education and avalanche incidents and case studies. I almost got away with not talking. <laughs> How do I button? Middle and then laser. All right, cool. So I'm going to cover avalanche education and case studies. And I was pretty psyched to get avalanche education as a topic, actually, because um, it is a pretty contested thing about the effectiveness of it. And it's, I think, a really exciting time to be involved in avalanche education, particularly as it's a changing product. Um, in an ideal world, everyone would have just a lifelong mentor, right? That would be the best education process. Uh, but unfortunately, similar to John's tactic of the lengthwise hot dog scarf carry for skins, that's just not practical, right? We can't mentor everyone. So a lot of these are just going to be po like pictures of posters I saw that are interesting. Um, a lot will have QR codes, and I added some, but I actually requested to go last because I feel like there were overlaps in so many of these topics that it's really interesting to tie them to other papers. And that was kind of the noteworthy thing for me um, with this. The, so this poster by Tara was really interesting uh, about you know, how useful is it to teach a rec level one a bunch of snow pit tests and different opinions. And if you take that survey there, um, whether you're a forecaster or a ski patroller, um, you can weigh on on that. Oh wait, should I go back? I can go back. How do I go back? Yeah, um, you can look at the pros and cons listed. Um, her, her paper is also linked on this QR code here. Good. Uh, so this QR code is actually for an interview with Pascal Hagley, who I really love his approaches to studying how users actually use the avalanche forecast. It's really interesting, and that's, that's a good audio interview with him, um, which I sometimes like more than just reading continual papers. And I, I like, they put a lot of these questions. This was a Norwegian poster at the end of an avalanche forecast to actually test people's answers to this. And I put this on my Instagram story, too, just to see what people would say. And most everyone was like, well, I need slope, slope angle shading on it. And I was like, well, there was a time before sloping shading, right, where we, we look at terrain and we read it a lot more. So it's really interesting to see um, people's responses to these. Um, similar with this, you know, are people actually looking at this and inferring, you know, on which piece of terrain would they find that product? Um, again, really interesting to see demographics of, of what people are getting from the avalanche forecast. So there's a paper on double loop learning, which I really loved, um, by Ted Dasser. And double loop learning is essentially, you know, we have our assumptions that we have about the snow or whatever. We go out and we have actions, we have our process by which we go out and tour or do whatever, and then, you know, we have some sort of resultant at the end. And in this sort of medium, it's very hard often to get feedback, right? And he applied this sort of learning technique to rec students. And my first thought was, oh, this is probably way harder for professionals, actually. Um, because we need a very big interrupting action in order to actually change our behavior. Because a lot of it is so rote and so ingrained in us. Our process, after so many years of being professionals, it takes a big thing to change that. 
So the perfect example I thought of to illustrate this is myself. Um, I was pretty close to a fatal avalanche that was from a course collapse. And I always told myself that I would be more careful around cornices forever, for years, for years of time. That was the story I told myself. And it took up until this incident where um, Zach and I had skied, had a fun day. And I was just kind of being lazy and took one step off into the snow here. You can see where this cornice is moting out. And triggered this cornice and triggered like a D3 avalanche on the slope below. So I went five years telling myself that I was a lot more careful around cornices, but there was actually, looking back, no behavioral change there until this moment. So emphasizing that learning loop. Um, a lot of the paper is centered around self-reflection as well. Um, this is a paper by Kelly McNeil, and she studied groups that have ta taken a rec level one um, six weeks, a year, and two years. And that way we kind of get that longitudinal study as to what skills people are actually learning. Um, really good paper to read. But I found it interesting how many people are practicing with the rescue gear, but then how many less aren't doing it timed, which is a pretty fundamental thing. So as educators, I think really pushing that this is like one of the skills that people can really practice, but they do need to know how much time it's taking them. So that's a pretty fundamental part of avalanche rescue. Uh, second, I'm not gonna cover this fully because Ian, Ian's here. <laughs> He's gonna talk about it tomorrow and he will speak to it far better than I can. Um, but really interesting on inclinometer uncertainty. Uh, you know, I can't kind of zoom in on these because predominantly we use, you know, either a a ball measure, a compass, or our cell phone. And really interesting degrees of uncertainty with those. And then how often they're underestimated by three degrees by people, or greater than three degrees. Uh, and this is also really interesting, right? Because as educators, sometimes we really push like specific slope angle things. And from this I learned uh, I, I really like this suggestion of kind of tying it to the eight scale, which, um, if you're not familiar, is this. It's sort of, instead of just having these specific degrees, we make terrain simple, challenging, or complex, and then recommend something based on that. He'll talk more about it tomorrow. Uh, next, I really liked this. Um, this QR code actually goes to Avalanche Canada's motorized mentorship program, which is really cool. It's like a fundamentally new thing. There's a lot of, not a lot of mentorship in the motorized use. And what they did is they just started it. Um, they started this program that kind of matches people up and they're mentored for their years on sleds. But I found this on Avalanche Canada as well. It's the Ten Commandments of sledding. And I was like, oh, this is perfect for skiers, actually, too. <laughs> kind of applies to us all. Um, but they have a really good program, and that's a really good paper. And that's you know something I would like to see in development here in years to come. Uh, similarly, I really liked this poster, using different types of media to reach different users. And this is just about using sort of like YouTube vlogs uh, or like sort of pseudo influence, um, influencer types as means of really influencing people in a positive direction. Um, because as we know, like social media, these forms of media have a lot of influence on where people go and on their decision making. And sort of having a positive influence on that can be really good. I'm gonna tie back into this uh, because the first thing I thought of when I saw this um, was that, oh, you know, if you're guiding a particularly bad client that day, you just get a little ahead of them and you dig a ECT that tapers at the bottom 
and all of a sudden it's really scary out there. <laughs> it's time to get out. <laughs> so, you know, put that one in your back pocket for later. <laughs> uh, next were case studies. Well, obviously, as Zach mentioned, a lot of research these days is focusing on endocrinology because it's a really cool way to study avalanches kind of going back in time and natural avalanche activity because you can see these impact growths on the downward side of the tree as the tree gets hit and bent over, it tries to right itself. And so that's where they're looking at that scarring. Boom, that year, uh, 2020 in Colorado was pretty remarkable, right? If you, they were able to go and look at tree rings all the way back to 1695. And there has not been as significant of an avalanche cycle there um, on record which is pretty interesting. And to me, this really emphasizes the difference between weather and climate. These are two different ent things to think about. And sometimes we think about them as the same thing, but at ISSW, across different talks um, about climate, about whatever else, about different models, what they, well, at least what I saw, was overall less snow and less avalanche activity over time. And anecdotally, like looking back 10 years, I see that in my experience. But that does not mean that we can't have significant weather events, right, that cause really large, unpredictable avalanche cycles. Which segues <laughs> into this really interesting case study um, in the Chugach by Andrew Schauer. Um, which also ties into, there is a discussion about atmospheric rivers being much less predictable, having a lot more moisture than usual. And this event, I believe, yeah, 10 inches in 24 hours of precip, which is 20 to 25 feet of snow in some areas. Look at Zach, he's there, he's ready for the river. He's got a PFD, <laughs> he's got his helmet, he's also, shaped like an arrow, which is really helpful for the next slide, because um, I want to point out this layer <laughs> this layer. So what I found interesting about Andrew's talk is that they developed, I don't know who puts the surface at zero, but this is the new snow working down to the ground. Um, they developed two crossed facet layers that were actually really similar to what we had last season. Um, not a lot of activity. This was I'm trying to think, Halloween, be deeper. Yeah, this was their New Year's crust, and you know I can't, I just can't emphasize enough um, how many weird avalanche and avalanche cycles I've seen on like rounding facets, and how there can be not a lot of activity that we're seeing, and. You know, all it takes is a little bit of wind or a little bit more snow to wake that back up in a way that's kind of unexpected to us. So that was just some food for thought that I wanted to throw out there for us. Um, there isn't that much different from the structure than what we had, but they had a significant cycle. And so if you think about that and you think about all it's gonna take is you make that structure a little bit more shallow, a little bit less snow, maybe a little bit different in the climate, and this is gonna talk more here. So just keep that in mind going into this season. Uh, next, of course, we have Stephen and Lori's talk, which I, we just heard, so I'm not gonna talk about, but I did wanna show just how many paths they're dealing with, like 64 named avalanche paths. So after we just go high five them after this <laughs> um, and applaud them for working in such, you know, this is a really stressful work environment. Um, and those are some also cool photos from Grom. Thanks, Grom, of that cycle. In the end. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, panelists, for taking the time to pick out papers and to summarize them and to give all of us some food for thought and some papers to dig into.
Um, it is 444, so uh, even though Don spent a lot of time drafting three questions, I'm gonna ask you one of them, and then we're gonna wrap up. Um, and my question is, uh, the, CAI, the CAIC spent considerable amount of time last summer backcasting their forecasts during some notable events from three different years. And they looked at all the avalanches, observations, and weather that occurred during a specific forecast period, and with 2020 hindsight, decided whether they had under-forecasted or over-forecasted for that period. Do you think that is a tool that you would incorporate in, for, into your operation in, by some degree? And if so, can you just give us a sentence or two on how you might use that uh, moving forward? Hopefully I can get I'm ready. To talk. I got an answer. All right, there we go. Um, I have done this before, actually. When I was working a whole lot of Knowles winter courses, uh, I this was like pre-taking cell phones into the field, um, would use the CAIC flow chart that was on the screen a long time ago and generate my own forecast for like 10 days, two weeks of camping every day. And I would put a hazard rating every day for what I thought the hazard was. And then after the course, I would go back cast and check my work against the forecast center because usually I was operating in an area that had a forecast, I just didn't have access to it. And it was incredibly valuable. This was earlier in my career uh, and I learned a lot checking my work and tended to sometimes over forecast. I also was like in a really small zone and so that kind of changed it. Maybe I was seeing different things. But it is interesting, like checking my own talk about updating mental models. I am like, oh, right, that was really valuable to me when I was getting going. It would probably be really valuable to me again now. And so having kind of heard this talk at ISSW, I do want to go um, check my work again, probably not in real time as much, just because it's I feel too busy. But um, yeah, maybe like pick the significant event and do it when the weather's really crummy in like April, May. Yeah, great. Other thoughts on this? All right. Sure. Um, <laughs> I think it would be interesting. I'm not sure it would be actionable. I think we will always have to err on the side of over forecasting or, you know, a side of caution. Um, I think what could be interesting for us is going back in particular and looking at some of those notable, notable events that we maybe under forecast um, to help us in the future mitigate yeah. that particular weakness. Steal the mic. So yeah, at the Sawtooth Avalanche Center, so we do do a reassessment or a verification. We don't do it in the summer. Um, we don't have the operational capacity because they, they spend hundreds of hours doing that because you need to spin back up on everything that's going on and you know refamiliarize yourself with all the base constraints. So we do it the, the day after because it's, it's part of the workflow as a forecaster anyhow. You need to figure out what is what was it yesterday, and then what changed. And sometimes we'll revise that, you know, if it's during a storm that we may go back when we can see, when the dust settles and see what happened. But um, it's, so yeah, I think it's getting to the point where it'll be really interesting to look at. There's several avalanche centers that are using the, the same reassessment process, meaning the same causes for errors, including Colorado. We set it up with them several years ago. Yeah. So I think we'll, we're getting to the point where we have, you know, 10,000 days now and we can look at the error rate by problem, by danger, by elevation band, by all kinds of things. It's just a matter of finding the time to play with the data. So I think that, that's the biggest thing for us. The reason why is to create that data set to figure out where we're screwing up and then, and why, and then fix it. Yeah, to kind of dovetail on that a little bit, I think it's important to also document your uncertainty when you're doing this, both in the forecast and then afterwards for the reassessment, because oftentimes the most uncertain forecasts are gonna be that line between moderate and considerable where there isn't a whole lot of signs that it's particularly stable, but there are, are also aren't a lot of signs that it's extremely unstable. So that kind of moderate to considerable line is a really hard one for a forecaster, and ultimately we have to default to what we think the best message we want the users to get is. And objectively, if you look back at that, you may not be able to say with any certainty that, yes, you know, February 12th was considerable. Um, really, you just can say, is that the appropriate message given the weather setup and the snowpack conditions for the day? And to kind of harken back to what Scotty just said is 
it, it would be really hard to do that in the summertime. We like to actually have the feel of what the snowpack is doing, particularly if you're in an operation that doesn't get to go out and throw bombs all day or have, you know, 400 skiers all ski, you know, your avalanche terrain. So I think that's one caveat to think of uh, before anybody implements that sort of technique. Yeah, building on what Scotty and Ethan said, we're, we're using their reevaluation matrix this season, which will be super useful. And yeah, similarly, like a lot of last year was weather coming in at 8 a.m. Um, and often, you know, it was kind of just unpredictable, like the weather models were wrong or the RPK was wrong. And when that happens, I, I at least try to speak to that uncertainty in the forecast, similar to what Ethan was saying, like, you know, I have to kind of put it at the highest that I think it'll reach based on a weather forecast. But if I'm uncertain on that weather forecast, I write in like, okay, if we don't get this much snow, then, you know, it's not this. And it's kind of up to you guys to like read and, you know, integrate that into your work or play or whatever. And then I guess I'll touch on uh, a bit of what Lori said and then Scott and Ethan as well, just uh, uh, operationally forecasting on going to the Sun Road and leading that program. We're just hitting our 20th year last year, I think. And so we're finally coming to a point where we probably have the data to start doing a bit more thorough reanalysis of how quality and how on point our closures for the road are for the road crew or where we're calling it tight. A unique environmental concern or uh, fortunate piece of our forecasting program is that we all work really closely. We're a tight-knit little small community of forecasters that are pretty much every day up there, and we're purely forecasting for natural avalanches. So we get a lot of feedback really quickly, and we can change that forecast, unlike a public one, in the middle of the day, if something changes quickly that we didn't expect. But I think going back through and reanalyzing, we did a little bit of this last year, but time and funding are often kind of the, the things that we lack to actually get a thorough reanalysis done. So really relevant stuff, though. Yeah, great. Great points, everyone. And I know that not everyone is actually forecasting hazard, um, but a lot of us are. And I think when we talk about avalanche courses, I think the most important thing is to have an opinion and write your opinion down in your field book, because then you can actually go back and do some of this testing and ground truthing of, was my opinion right? Did we just need one inch of water on this weak layer before we had huge avalanche activity? Or did this weak layer hold three inches of water before the sky fell? Um, when I was talking to Don about this question, it reminded me of, in a lot of our courses, we talk about human factors and human vulnerabilities, and we've talked about going through accidents and near misses personally, look, using facets to find out what our individual vulnerabilities are, and then choosing partners that balance that out. It can also be leveraged with something like this. If you're looking at your forecast sheets and you find that you tend to under forecast in, these con in certain conditions or over forecast, that can be really useful information for your team, for how you leverage other people's knowledge and build your team accordingly. So thanks everyone. Thank you so much panelists, really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Lynn for closing remarks.